Well, the BBC has a website called Lab UK whose remit is to marry um, scientific data or new scientific ideas for research with scientists and with the general public in order to provide big sample sizes. So they had come up with the idea to test whether brain training games actually work. So along with Bango's theory, we approached Adrian Owen and the Alzheimer Society to see if they would be interested in helping us you know, set up this mass experiment. I saw it as a great opportunity because brain training is something that many thousands of people do now and if you really wanted to test whether it works or not it, it seemed as though involving many many people was, was, was really a very good way to do it. And By collaborating with BBC Lab UK we were able to involve many many thousands of people uh, and get them training in different ways to really try and nail down if brain training works and if so how does it work. The sort of holy grail of brain training really is that they will transfer to other types of cognitive functions. So we all know that if you practice something you get good at it. So that, that, you know, there's no doubt that if you do a brain training game you'll, you'll get better at that brain training game. The question we were really trying to get at is does it lead to any general benefits in other areas of life, in other aspects of, of cognitive function. So 11,500 people between the ages of 18 and 60 took part in this mass experiment. We basically separated them out into three groups. We had a control group that took part in just regular internet activities, a group that took part in reasoning exercises, and another group that took part in non-reasoning exercises. So we could be sure that all three groups were using a computer for about the same amount of time every day, uh, but only two of the groups were doing any sort of formal brain training. One of them was very targeted on aspects of reasoning and the other was rather more general. And we benchmark tested them beforehand to see their general brain power abilities. Then they trained and then we retested them. These are cognitive tests that we've developed in Cambridge and we've used in many experiments involving functional imaging and studies of neuropsychological populations. We know that they're very sensitive to cognitive change. And we use these as our real measure of whether the brain training that people subsequently went on to do would have any effect. Each of the two uh, training groups uh, did, of course, improve on the tests that they were actually training on. This is practice. We've known about this for, for many, many years. Um, you get better at, at, what, at what you practice at. The key result was that this didn't transfer. People were very surprised when they found out. I was actually quite surprised when I found out. And there were a few cynics in the crowd that when we asked them before, you know, D do you think this works? They were like, nah, probably not. But I think they were probably just second guessing us. Most people in, in the studio that day were quite aghast when we told them actually there's absolutely no difference in your cognitive skills. One of the really interesting things about these data is that not only were there uh, negligible transfer effects to other cognitive domains but also that was the case when the training tasks and the, the benchmarking tests were really very closely related to one another so you know one example is we had a, a memory training task that was rather like the classic uh, parlor game of pairs where you have to remember where two objects that are similar are placed in a, in a deck of cards people that trained at that task didn't get any better at a benchmarking test that in a similar way required that they remember the locations of objects. You know, it's like learning a musical instrument. If you, if you want to get better at the violin, then, you know, practice the violin. But you're not going to get any better playing the trumpet by practicing the violin. I think when we set out to do this mass experiment and, and launch it on Bang, and then, you know, with the view to make this one hour special, I don't think we realised how big this was, this was all going to get. And you know, I learned so much, but I think to be doing it with someone as esteemed as Adrian, to have a paper published in Nature is uh, a little bit surreal and, and, and absolutely fantastic for us. To run an experiment like this using traditional laboratory methods where we would bring participants in and sit them down in front of a dedicated computer, it would have taken us years and years and years to do it. Um, but just putting up a website, inviting people to participate via the, the BBC program to raise the, you know, the profile, you know, allowed us to do it in six weeks. And that's something, um, you know, I, I think there are many different applications of that, of that type of approach.